Hello everyone, my name is Pastor Blake and we're continuing our study with the book of Joshua in chapter 10. Now we're not going to get all the way through chapter 10. It's a very long chapter and he kind of has two main uh, sections of it and uh, we're going to go all the way down to verse 28, uh, verse 29 on in through chapter 12, uh, 11 sorry, will be the next segment for next week. So uh, chapter 10 verse 29 on all the way through chapter 11 will be our next segment. All right. So this is a famous chapter. Most people know something about this chapter. Um, it is uh, usually titled The Sun Stands Still. It's a very amazing uh, thing that happened in the Bible, really. Uh, and Joshua was a part of it. And um, But when the sun stands still, we do have to look at, I mean, you can look on the internet, you can Google it, um, when the sun stood still, that there is uh, some kind of scientific data for it. Some people say there's not. So um, we're not going to get into that today, necessarily. You can research that for yourself. However, we believe that the sun stood still. We believe that this was an event that happened. Um, there was lots of theories for exactly what this could be. Maybe it was. it felt like a long day, but it does seem to be more of a positive statement, as in the sun really did stand still and that there was no other day like that uh, since then. Now we do know Elijah kind of had a similar situation uh, in a little bit of a way. Um, we do know that the shadow of the sun moved back like 10 steps. So, uh, But that's that's really not the same kind of concept as what was happening here. Okay, So when we get into this, know that um, we just simply believe the sun stood still at some point in history. And we believe that it happened around Joshua. You can research that uh, further uh, for what science says about that. But um, I'd encourage you, the Word of God is our, our, is our supreme authority on all of this. So we look to it. Um, but whenever we look to the Word of God, um, you know, in chapter 9, we had the Gideonite, Dece or the Gibeonite deception. We had the Gibeonites. Uh, they came uh, from, it seemed like far away. They wore a whole bunch of old stuff to make themselves look like they came from a far distance when they really hadn't. They just knew that uh, Israel was on a path conquering Canaan. And so they wanted to kind of stop that. They wanted to covenant it with them. And so they would not destroy them. Now, unfortunately, they deceived them. However, God did allow for them, their covenant to remain. Uh, he even defended them in battle, which we see in chapter 10. So that's where we're at. So in verse Verse 1, we see as soon as Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard about Joshua, um, how he had captured Ai and had devoted it to destruction, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, he feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city like the one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all its men were warriors. So this king goes on. He realizes, wow, uh, the Gibeonites uh, kind of have betrayed all of us in Canaan. They were one of the major royal cities. Uh, we have all of our kingdoms, and we want to keep ourselves in power. We do not want to be conquered. So we're going to go attack Gibeon for what they've done to us. And Gibeon is a really big city. I mean, it's a, it's a huge, powerful city. So the Gibeonites and the Israelites come together, we won't be able to attack them. However, right now, I can get five kings from around this area to come, and we can all attack them all at once, and then we'll be able to conquer them. And so that's basically what he does. He, he gets five kings from around his area, and he goes to attack Gibeon. He shows up at their door. He starts attacking them. Some people from Gibeon get out and go ask Joshua, hey, there's people attacking us. Can you come and can you help us? You know, don't rest right now. We have, we have a, a battle that is about to ensue. And so we see that the kings from around the area, uh, they knew that uh, this was a problem. So they did this. And that's kind of verse 1 and 2. Verses 3 through 5 is kind of the, the kings telling you each one of the kings that came to do this. They came up to Gibeon. Uh, they were going to destroy Gibeon. So we see that happening. I'd encourage you also, um, through the rest of this book, it really, through the whole book of Joshua, look up a conquest of Canaan map. On uh, Google, uh, you can find different um, atlases, uh, Bible maps, uh, atlases and stuff. It's really interesting to see how the um, the structure of the battles went. Because there's a central campaign, there's kind of a southern campaign, and then a northern campaign. And you really get to see how all of the... Um, how all the cities lined up. So it kind of helps you figure out where these people were going this whole time. So the five kings were actually, you see, if you look on the map, they were kind of spread out. They weren't just like all around Gibeon. They were kind of spread out and they all came up to fight Gibeon. And so I'd encourage you to do that. And so the five kings came together to destroy him. Verse 6, we see, Since Gibeon was now 
in, uh, was now in covenant with Joshua, Joshua had an obligation to kind of fight against their enemies as well. Now, um, as far as covenants go, uh, they didn't really make a covenant to protect them. They made a covenant to not destroy them. So there was a little bit of um, ambiguity in the covenant. However, uh, knowing that God is always a merciful God, even to these enemies directly of Israel, he actually does extend his hand to Joshua and says, I have given you these people into your hand. You can go and you can fight for Gibeon and you can protect them as one, as your covenant um, uh, ensures. So you can go ahead and do this. However, uh, I have given them into your hand. So go for it, Joshua. And so uh, that's exactly what Joshua does. Verses 7 and 8, Joshua took all the men of war to go fight the five kings. And it's interesting because if you look in verse 8, it says, oh, got to page. In verse 8, it says, And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. I have. That's past tense. You understand when God speaks, he speaks from all knowledge of all time, of all things and all places, everywhere at once. So he knows that this battle will be won. Joshua, I have given them into your hands. However, we see that, um, and, and we have to look at our lives the same, that we see that Joshua still had to fight the battle, okay? Sometimes we ask, we pray that the Lord take this from me. And the Lord doesn't want to take whatever it could be, uh, what, your stresses and your anxieties, something like that, you're, you're learning patience and stuff. We know that sometimes the Lord doesn't take things from us a lot. He actually goes through and walks with us through those things. So whenever you're praying, it seems like it's not working. Look, you need to start praying, Lord, help me through this situation, not just take it away. Because, I mean, hey, when, uh, when, uh, when, when trials and temptations come, you know, count it all joy. That knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, just like James talks to us about. And so know that the Lord, uh, he, he won't tempt you. However, he does let you go through these trials and these testings of your faith, knowing that you will be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. And so if God's doing that to you, you don't really want him to take that from you. He's trying to refine you and for you to be a better person in who you are. But always the Lord will walk through us with these situations. That's kind of what he did with Joshua. So he didn't take it from Joshua. He said, I've given them into your hands. However, you still have to go fight them. Okay. And so in verses 9 and 10, we see Joshua came up to the army quick and started to fight. Now he was walking all night. So quickly it just, boom, probably around the next corner there was the army. Uh, God was with him, so uh, they did not stop. The armies were terrified to see Israel show up. Now, remember, all these armies knew that Israel had taken over Egypt, uh, that they had taken over Jericho, uh, Ai, and also Og, and um, uh, the people even before the Jordan. And so, remember that they know a lot of these people have been conquered already by Israel. So, seeing this army just come around the corner, ready for battle, it would have been terrifying. Now, the distance is kind of surprising. From Gilgal, where the army of Israel and all of Israel were encamped, to Gibeon was about 15 miles, okay? And so they were actually walking all night long, 15 miles, and then in, you know, in that day they got up, that's when they started fighting. So they didn't get to camp, it seems. They didn't get to really have a break. They just kind of started fighting all of a sudden. And so we see that um, in uh, verse 11, the armies fled from Israel. God threw down large stones from heaven and killed more people than Israel's armies killed. Now, it does sound like uh, quite a bit like the plague in Egypt, uh, the hell stones, fire mixed with blood. This doesn't seem to have blood in it, but uh, God wanted to destroy these five armies. Now, remember, they're on a Canaan conquest, so they were already going to attack these people eventually. They were going to eventually go through, but hey, all of you came to Gibeon, the people we're in covenant with, might as well take y'all out right now. And so that's kind of what was happening. And God was throwing down these stones from heaven somehow. I, somehow. <laughs> and he was actually killing more people than the people of Israel were. And so God was truly fighting for them. We see in 12 and 15, Joshua, seeing the progress made, prayed to the Lord. The sun and the moon stood still so the fighting could continue. This event uh, has never happened again, it says in verse 13. Um, and it's even talked about somewhat in the book of Jasher in 2 Samuel 1, 18. I'll put the references down below. It does say, and it, he said it um, should be taught to the people of Judah. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher, he said. So uh, this book, we don't really know much about this book other than it, it's something that was uh, more of a rhymes or like a song book of some sort. 
And so uh, back in, people knew about it, but right now it seems like they didn't. But what a powerful event. Sun stands still at Gibeon, the moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun and moon stood still, and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Hey, you got five kingdoms to destroy. This is not a simple battle. This is a long process that is needs to happen and needs to keep going. They don't need to run back to their camps and their uh, cities and then fortify themselves. Joshua knew we need to end this right now. Sun, stand still. Moon, stand still. And so... Uh, you know, God definitely answered that prayer. Now, obviously, God knew it was going to happen. God, in a way, did it himself because uh, we don't have really the power to stop the moon and sun. However, that amazing event is recorded in several different other cultures from around the world. You can research that later. I encourage you to do that. And so um, the sun stood still to basically give them a whole nother day. Now, remember, all night walking in uh, 15 miles and then fighting, these five kingdoms just started spreading out, going back down to all of their places. And the Lord told them, hey, don't let them get back and fortify themselves. Don't let them get into their cities. You go chase them, destroy them. And so that's what they did. And God was allowing them to have a whole other day to even do this. Now, it would have been rough. It would have been tiring. However, God gave them all of these kingdoms into the hands of Joshua and Israel. And so they didn't have to worry about fatigue or not winning. They knew they were going to win. They just had to physically go do this battle. And so uh, amazing time. Um, and then verses 16 through 19, we see the five kings hid themselves in a cave in Makeda, which is very pretty far down south, if you'll look on a map, um, kind of the almost at the end, toward the end of their southern conquest. Um, so they were quite a bit of ways away. Joshua instructed large stones to be put in front of the cave and for some people to guard the cave until he got back. Joshua instructed the people to pursue the armies and destroy them until to make sure they didn't get back into their camps. And so we see that he did do this. And after that, what do they do? They come back and they um, they actually do take the stones out of the way after they have destroyed all of these other armies. And uh, the people groups, they come back to this cave. They get the five kings out of the cave. And then uh, he he has all his little general, the chiefs of the tribes come along and, and put their feet upon the necks of these kings. Now, this was a, a custom that was pretty commonplace. Um, however, it does actually uh, putting the feet like a footstool. Who do we hear that from? We hear that in uh, David, for one thing, uh, in Psalm 110.1. It says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstools. It's it's something that parallels, and even in Jesus' time, we talk about it again. And um, and so, powerful moments. And uh, But, I mean, come on. You realize if you get to the point where a king, you can put your neck, your foot on the neck of a king, you have conquered that king. And so, it's a lot of symbolism as well, just knowing that, hey, this king is done. He has conquered. There is no more to be done. And so, uh, we see that they did this same kind of thing uh, to them. And so uh, all the chiefs put their feet on them like that. And then verse 25, we see, uh, Joshua encouraged them, the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. Now this reaffirms in chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, we see. Um, he kind of says the same thing. You know, we know the whole Achan thing brought him and got him into a little bit of trouble. But uh, the Lord is reaffirming this whole thing. And, and Joshua is encouraging the people. Look, the Lord has given us all these people. Look what we have done. The Lord gave us an extra day of light in itself. He, he did all of this stuff for us. We, we conquered five kingdoms basically today. And so we see that all of this was happening um, all at once. So this was a big moment for Israel. And uh, they would have been quite encouraged and quite um, uh, probably pumped up by all these events and stuff. And so in verse 26 and 27, Joshua then struck them and hung them from a tree, all the five kings. He, he struck them, he killed them, he hung them from a tree. But he did have men remove them before night and throw their bodies into the cave that they were hiding in. Um, it, hanging on a tree was a curse even for anyone else. Uh, we see in Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 through 23, it says, And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, 
and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day, for a hanging man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. Same thing happened to uh, Jericho's king. Same thing happened to Ai's. It's kind of casual. We hear like, it's weird that he says, you know, we took them down. Well, one reason is that Joshua is letting the later people know that, hey, we kept all these laws. Uh, so you, you can't blame anything on us because what Deuteronomy said, we were doing that too. So it's just interesting to see those links and how they were uh, living their lives like that. And so they couldn't just keep a body, a dead person uh, hanging on a tree or anything. They had to bury them the same day. So in verses 28, while the people were there the same day, Joshua also captured Makeda and devoted every person to destruction. So while he was there. So now I will say the next portion of uh, the end of chapter 10, uh, starting in verse 29, it is the kind of the Southern conquest uh, narrative. Now I encourage you to understand this could even be happening while they're on their way. Uh, so some scholars believe that, that this was kind of more along their way while they were doing this and the kind of like, Hey, they went down and they captured everyone when they destroyed everyone. And then now they're expanding. Okay, these are the things that happened while when all that was happening. So it could be a bigger explanation because if you look at a map, it would be a lot of back and forth, kind of for no reason, it seems. So it could be that, or it could be just the continuing narrative. So when you read this, if you say, huh, it seems like they're hitting all these places that they already said they were hitting. Well, it's because it, he's kind of expounding on the idea of what they did while all this was happening. So um, just something to consider. So uh, be reading uh, chapter 10, verses 29 through the rest of the chapter 43, and then chapter 11. We're going to do all of that next week, all right? So I encourage you, Lord, hears your prayers. Keep praying, keep reading your word. Have a blessed day.